My name is Rupal Shaw, and I am a pulmonologist in San Francisco. I really appreciate you taking the time today to spend with me to talk about idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. I'm going to start with a case that may be familiar to you of Mr. M, who's a 72-year-old gentleman who noted increasing mild shortness of breath with inclines over the past two years. He went to see his primary care doctor after a while and was initially treated with inhalers for presumed COPD. When that didn't work, he was referred to a cardiologist and had a stress test, which was negative. Ultimately, he had a high resolution CT scan and was referred to see you. When you review the images of his high resolution CT scan, you see that there are areas of reticulation as well as traction bronchiectasis on the subpleural and basal or parts of the lung. Mr. M presents to clinic with you and says, is this pulmonary fibrosis? If it is, I Googled it online and it says that my life expectancy is three to five years. Is that true? Am I gonna die of this? Are there any treatments for this? Hopefully this case resonates with you for several reasons. One, the sort of winding path to a diagnosis of interstitial lung disease, as well as the significant concern and anxiety that patients often present with when they learn that this may be a possible diagnosis. From this talk today, I hope that you will learn what IPF is, what the pathogenesis and risk factors are, importantly, what the diagnostic approach to somebody with interstitial lung disease is, in particular, focusing on how we diagnose IPF, and then finally, what treatment options are available once you have diagnosed someone with IPF. As you know, IPF is one of over 200 types of interstitial lung disease. So it is a specific type of ILD. Um, although when patients hear ILD, they often think of IPF and ILD as being synonymous. There are many, many different types of ILD. And the way that I often think of this is trying to divide people into buckets. The first bucket being exposure related. Is this related to something in your environment, something that you're taking, uh, something in your workplace? The second major bucket is connective tissue disease or autoimmune. Is this related to an underlying systemic condition? And then the third bucket is the one that IPF falls into, which is idiopathic pneumonias, where we may not identify an underlying issue. And then finally, there's a long category of other types of ILDs. But when we think about approaching general ILD in terms of buckets, it makes it much more manageable to try to arrive at the correct diagnosis. IPF is a specific form of chronic progressive fibrotic interstitial lung disease. It typically occurs in older adults. And as we'll talk about, the exact cause is unclear, although there are several hypotheses on the pathogenesis of IPF. The presentation of IPF is often nonspecific. And as we talked about in the case that I started with, the diagnosis can often be delayed for a couple years because the symptoms are so nonspecific and providers are often ruling out things that they may perceive as more common, such as heart disease and obstructive airways disease. In general, patients present with slowly progressive shortness of breath, often a dry cough. You may find on exam clubbing and bibasal or crackles. And rarely these patients are seen first in hospital settings when they may present with an exacerbation or acute respiratory failure. So it's important for us um, as pulmonologists to have a high index of suspicion for ILDs, and in particular IPF, when patients present to us with shortness of breath uh, to avoid these long delays in diagnosis. How common is IPF? It is difficult to obtain accurate estimates, but we do know that the prevalence appears to be increasing as well as the number of hospitalizations and deaths. However, it's unclear if that prevalence is increasing because of early detection or an actual increase in cases. The prevalence ranges from 10 to 60 cases per 100,000 patients in the United States. We have found that the incidence of IPF tends to be higher in North America and Europe compared to South America and East Asia. But again, it's not clear if that is related to a specific genetic or biologic rationale or if it's related to detection and testing. Overall, IPF is in general a rare disease, but is becoming increasingly common.
When we think about IPF amongst all the other types of interstitial lung disease, we find that IPF does represent a significant portion of our patients with ILD. In this one um, review, they noted that about 20% of patients with ILD um, had IPF. And when we looked at the data here at the University of California in San Francisco, we found that similarly patients with IPF uh, accounted for between 20 and 25% of our patients with ILD. So how do patients get IPF? What are the factors that cause IPF? And we think that premature aging or senescence of our alveolar epithelial cells and fibroblasts appear to be sort of the central phenotype that is contributing to this deposition of fibrosis in the lungs. And whether that senescence is related to genetic susceptibility, as you'll see in the top bar, with several different mutations uh, being associated with IPF, or if it's related to external injury from autoimmunity, chemicals, particulate matter, um, or a combination of those factors, we think that those factors lead to activation of several pathways, including coagulant cascades, antioxidant pathways, increase in fibrocytes, macrophage stimulation, that leads to an imbalance that favors profibrotic mediators which ultimately leads to excessive extracellular matrix deposition and pulmonary fibrosis. There is ongoing research to try to better elucidate what external insults, what genetic susceptibilities, and exactly which pathways are helping to contribute to this fibrosis. But we know that this is likely a disease uh, related to multiple risk factors and multiple insults with complex pathways leading to fibrosis. What are some clinical risk factors for IPF? We know that IPF tends to occur in older men who previously smoked cigarettes. We know that there is an increased prevalence of gastroesophageal re reflux disease in patients with IPF, as well as chronic viral infections. Family history of ILD is known to be a risk factor as well as air pollution um, and other environmental factors can contribute to IPF. There are genetic syndromes of pulmonary fibrosis, and I'll highlight a few of them here. The first is familial pulmonary fibrosis defined solely by having a positive family history of IPF. We have found in the population of patients with familial pulmonary fibrosis that mutations in surfactant proteins, as well as mucin 5B, are, are more common in this population of familial pulmonary fibrosis. We know that there is an increased uh, incidence of bronchogenic carcinomas in these patients. And there was also a recent paper in CHEST that showed that self-reported family history of ILD led to an 80% increased risk of death or transplantation. So we believe that this group of people who have familial pulmonary fibrosis tend to have worse outcomes than those patients with sporadic IPF. So family history can sort of help us not only prognosticate, but help us inform decision-making on referrals to transplant or palliative care. The second syndrome is hermansky pudelak syndrome, which is um, a genetic syndrome that is autosomal recessive, is associated with oculocutaneous albinism and platelet abnormalities, tends to present earlier in life, um, and is more common in certain populations, in particular Puerto Ricans. Um, telomeropathies are related to a family of mutations that cause genes, uh, that affect genes that help keep our telomeres healthy. So when these genes are mutated, we get premature telomere shortening. And this can be associated with not just fibrosis of the lungs, but fibrosis in the liver leading to cirrhosis, dyskeratosis in the skin, as well as issues with bone marrow, both cytopenias and macrocytosis. When I am talking to patients in clinic, not only do I ask about family history, I also ask about premature graying, because we know that early graying, and when I'm saying early graying, I mean in late teens and 20s, is associated with telomeropathies. Of course, not all patients who gray early have a telomeropathy, but if patients know early graying and they're presenting at a young age, it may raise your index of suspicion for a telomeropathy. These, when they are related to a known mutation, can be autosomal dominant, but we have also found mutations um, in patients who do not report a family history of pulmonary fibrosis. 
As I alluded to earlier, we know that patients with shorter telomere lengths have worse survival. So not just patients with a known genetic mutation, but if you were to measure patients with IPF and just look at telomere length, which you, uh, which we are able to do in a commercially available test, we know that those patients with short telomeres have worse survival, um, and that was validated across multiple cohorts. And again, I bring this up because short telomeres can also help us sort of inform prognosis when used in the correct clinical context. To move on to another genetic risk factor for IPF, the MUC5B or mucin5B mutation is associated with increased risk of IPF. Mucin5B is a gene that encodes mucin, which is responsible for uh, normal lung mucus. We know that a common variant in the promoter of MUC5B, so this variant causes increased expression of MUC5B, is associated with IPF. Homozygotes uh, for this variant had a 20-fold increased risk of uh, incidence of pulmonary fibrosis. Um, why do we think that this gene that's responsible for mucus production is associated with increased risk of IPF? There's a couple of different factors, but the thought is that the inability of the lungs to appropriately clear mucus leads to increased mucus deposition, um, impaired mucociliary transport, aberrant repair mechanisms, and activation of fibrotic um, cascade. And so the exact etiology of uh, why MUC5B is associated with su such high rates of fibrosis is unknown, but we do know that alterations in this pathway are associated with high risks of IPF. We, they've also shown that um, changes in MUC5B, so the patients with these genetic variants, um, have an increased risk of interstitial lung abnormality. So knowing that somebody has this uh, promoter variant can also help us identify patients who may be at higher risk for interstitial lung abnormalities. Why is the diagnosis of IPF so important? Um, why is it important for us to elucidate what specific type of ILD a patient has? Well, there's a couple reasons. One is shown in this graph here. Uh, you can see that the solid black line is those patients with IPF, and they tend to have a much worse prognosis compared to patients with other types of ILD. So in terms of counseling patients, thinking about therapeutic options, it's important to really understand what group um, of ILDs patients fall into. Additionally, patients with IPF are at increased risk of acute exacerbations or flare-ups of their lung disease. And I'll go into what this means in a little more detail in a few slides. But essentially, it's important to really categorize patients correctly, not only for therapeutic, but also for prognostic reasons, uh, because it does differ between the different ILDs. So how do we diagnose IPF? And I, the diagnosis of IPF starts the minute the patient walks into your clinic room. So you're gonna start with a really detailed history. And I always think about looking at um, ILDs with my detective hat on. So I tell patients, I'm gonna start asking you a lot of questions, including sort of from where you were born to where you are now, all the jobs you've had, what are patients' hobbies? And you'll find that in doing this detailed history, focusing on maybe occupational and environmental exposures, you can often sort of narrow down the diagnosis just with the history. So if a patient discloses to you that they have a parrot, or I had a patient recently tell me that they wanted to be wrapped in down all the time, it sort of raises my threshold for hypersensitivity pneumonitis. Um, on the other hand, if a patient reports no exposures or no medication uses, it may lower your threshold. And then you're going to move on to the exam, and we're looking for signs of connective tissue disease. Do they have ulcers? Is there raynodes? Is there sclerodactyly or skin tightening? The exam for IPF tends to be nonspecific. You often find dry crackles, primarily at the bases, or clubbing. But we can use our exam to sort of think about whether or not there's a systemic issue that may make IPF less likely. The next step in the diagnosis of ILD would be serologic testing and thinking about what serologies to order based on the patient's age and demographics and your pretest probability for autoimmune disease is important. But sending serologies to exclude a diagnosis of CTD 
in particular because lung fibrosis can often be the presenting sign of CTD is important. And once you've gone through all that, we land on a high-resolution CT scan, which is really going to be critical in your ability to diagnose the patient's interstitial lung disease. So I'm going to walk through the ATS-ERS guidelines on the diagnosis of IPF, because I think this is a helpful framework to sort of help us diagnose IPF with confidence and then also recognize when we're in a land where we don't feel, we either don't feel it's IPF or we need more information to feel confident about the diagnosis. So starting on the left-hand side of the slide, you are at an example of a definite UIP pattern or usual interstitial pneumonia. And this UIP pattern is associated with IPF. And when you have a UIP pattern and you've excluded other etiologies of lung disease, so they don't have connective tissue disease, they don't have primarily exposures, you can then land on a diagnosis of IPF. So it's important for us to be able to recognize the CT pattern of definite UIP, which is defined by peripheral predominant and basilar predominant reticulation and traction bronchiectasis, as well as honeycombing. And what honeycombing is are these stacks of cysts that you can see in this picture on the top right of the lung, um, which represents destruction of the air spaces because of fibrosis. So if you have this pattern with both honeycombing, subpleural, peripheral, um, and basal or predominant fibrosis, you are at a definite UIP pattern and your suspicion for IPF should be high. So that's an easy one. But what happens if you have what's called a probable UIP pattern? So you have this subpleural, basal or predominant reticulation, you have traction bronchiectasis, but you don't have the definitive feature of honeycomb. Then you're land in a probable UIP pattern. And we'll go through the diagnostic guidelines to say, well, in what situations can a probable UIP pattern lead us with confidence to a diagnosis of IPF? And in what situations do we need more information? And then taking a step back, you may have a patient with really nonspecific fibrosis. So they have some reticulation, it may be in a pattern with uh, that subpleural and basilar. It may not be, but it may not. It may not be associated with traction bronchiectasis. You don't have honeycombing, but you also don't have air trapping or significant ground glass to say, oh, this is an alternative diagnosis. Then you're in a place where this is indeterminate. It could be UIP, but you can't confidently exclude other diagnoses. In which case, you're going to need more information. And then finally alternative diagnoses are often very helpful. So if you have somebody with significant air trapping, um, as well as ground glass and areas of normal lung, as well as a, a, an exposure, you're starting to lean towards hypersensitivity and much less likely to be IPF. If you have somebody with cystic lung disease or um, evidence of pleurisy or pericarditis, again, you that may help you lean away from IPF. So certainly, the categories of alternative diagnosis and definite UIP are often the most helpful in sort of moving on to a diagnosis right then without other information. Whereas when you're in the probable or indeterminate, you may need additional information to feel confident in your diagnosis. What are some of the pathologic features? If you do proceed with a surgical lung biopsy, we wanna be sure that once you get the results, you can interpret them appropriately and give patients the correct diagnosis. So a definite UIP pattern on pathology often correlates with what you see on the CT scan. You see fibrosis, fibroblast foci, you may see honeycombing um, on the biopsy. You'll find that the fibrotic changes tend to be uh, peripheral and basal or predominant, um, and it tends to be a patchy process. So there is both temporal and spatial heterogeneity. In a probable UIP, pattern, you'll see some areas, some um, areas of fibrosis uh, as, but, or you'll only see honeycombing, but you will not see the constellation of findings, both fibrosis and honeycombing that will lead you to say, this is definite UIP. If it's indeterminate for UIP, um, there is fibrosis, but there is not enough defining features. There's not fibroblast foci, there's not other features that can give you a slam dunk UIP pattern. And then finally, similar to our radiology, if you have features 
like non-necrotizing granulomas or cysts or um, other features that will definitively clinch a different diagnosis or point you away from um, IPF, that can be really helpful as well. So putting together the information that you got from a CT and potentially the information from a pathology, we now arrive at this table from the clinical practice guidelines that will help us figure out when we can make the diagnosis of IPF. So I think it will be good to spend a minute just going through a couple of different scenarios so that it's really clear when you can make a diagnosis of IPF. So if you see a patient in clinic, let's say going back to our original case of Mr. M, you see him in clinic, he's a 72 year old man, he doesn't have any exposures, he doesn't have any signs or symptoms of connective tissue disease, you send the full complement of serologies, those are all negative. And you get a CT scan, and there is subcortical and basal or predominant reticulation and traction, as well as honeycomb. You are now in a definite high resolution CT pattern of UIP, and you can make a diagnosis of IPF. Um, you do not need a biopsy to land in this category. You have excluded alternative etiologies, and you can tell that patient that this is IPF. What if Mr. MCT did not have honeycombing and it just had reticulation and traction bronchiectasis? That would land him in a probable UIP pattern on his CT scan. There is some data that shows that in the right patient demographic group, that a probable UIP pattern has a very high predictive value for IPF. So in the right demographic, so in an older man, as well as a CT scan that has not only reticulation, but advanced traction bronchiectasis, we like to say a traction bronchiectasis score of greater than four, which means that there's traction in more than four lobes of the lung. That has a high predictive value for IPF. And again, in the right scenario with a patient who you've excluded other etiologies based on history, physical, and labs, they have a probable UIP pattern on CT scan. Um, you have a high predictive value for IPF, so high that I would not recommend proceeding with a surgical lung biopsy in that situation. However, you may find that Mr. M presents with a CT scan that is indeterminate for UIP. It has some fibrosis, a little bit of reticulation, but not tr enough traction bronchiectasis, no honeycombing, and the pattern is maybe a little more central than you think. This is a situation where you're in the indeterminate for UIP and you really need additional information to confirm the diagnosis. So in this case, obtaining tissue, whether that's through a surgical lung biopsy or a cryobiopsy may be helpful in making the diagnosis because if you are indeterminate for UIP, but your pathology shows a definite UIP pattern, you have a diagnosis of IPF. If you are indeterminate for UIP and your pathology shows a probable UIP and you have the right demographics and you've excluded alternative diagnosis, you are in the likely IPF category. So basically two of three histopathological patterns can lead you to a diagnosis of IPF when the CT is indeterminate. When the histopathology is indeterminate and the CT is indeterminate, um, in general, you this is a scenario where you really need a multidisciplinary discussion, and I'll talk a little more about that in the next slide, but this is a time when having a pulmonologist, a radiologist, and a pathologist in the room is really helpful in terms of determining whether or not this is IPF. Finally, if Mr. M presented with a CT that looked um, not like IPF, so there was maybe air trapping and central reticulation and traction. Well, if the biopsy shows UIP, this could still be IPF with an atypical presentation, keeping in mind that, for example, in familial pulmonary fibrosis, the, uh, the radiographs can actually look a little bit atypical, or it could be a UIP pattern related to something else. You can get a UIP pattern in rheumatoid arthritis, or even in hypersensitivity pneumonitis. So that is the place where if your CT looks atypical, your biopsy has UIP, where your clinical history 
Um, and exam findings and serologies can be really helpful in deciding between IPF or not. If the CT looks like atypical for IPF or UIP pattern and the histopathology looks indeterminate or atypical, you should be leaning towards an alternative diagnosis. So hopefully going through this table and thinking about your patient's CT findings, thinking about whether they need a biopsy, and then if they need a biopsy, what the biopsy shows will help allow you to really diagnose with confidence those patients who have IPF. So thinking about an algorithm for IPF, we're gonna look, walk through this approach um, to the diagnosis. So if you have a high suspicion for IPF, the patient doesn't have exposures or autoimmune disease, your next step is gonna be the high resolution CT. As we talked about in the last slide, if the high resolution CT has a definite UIP pattern, you're done, IPF. If the high resolution CT has a probable UIP pattern, you wanna think about what other characteristics of the patient may lean you towards having a high pretest probability for IPF. Um, this is where the multidisciplinary di diagnosis committee can be very helpful. Having an experienced ILD radiologist and pathologies to weigh in on the traction bronchiectasis score, the underlying pattern can be very helpful. But again, as we talked about, if you have a probable UIP pattern, you again may be able to go on to a diagnosis of IPF in the right situation. If you are not in that situation where you have a high pretest probability and you're in an indeterminate or alternative diagnosis, with the help of a multidisciplinary discussion, you can decide whether or not it's helpful to get a bronchiolar lavage or to proceed with a surgical lung biopsy. Or you may find that after that discussion, the group has landed on an alternative diagnosis. But what this algorithm really highlights is the importance of having a multidisciplinary discussion. And there is data around this multidisciplinary conference where when you get pulmonologists pathologists and radiologists in the room, there is greater and greater agreement on a diagnosis when there is room for this discussion and um, expert evaluation of radiology and pathology. Now I acknowledge that not everybody has the multidisciplinary conference available um, at their center. And so I just want to make a plug for utilization of telehealth. So most ILD centers now are offering telehealth. And so patients that previously lived too far from a center or were unwilling to drive can now access a multidisciplinary conference and discussion about their case via telehealth. And we have found that both from a patient and provider experience, that has been a very gratifying um, way of delivering clinical care for patients who otherwise were unable to access this. So just a plug to refer to your local ILD center, even if it's far away, because it can really help determine what diagnostic and therapeutic options um, the patient should pursue, and then ultimately what their diagnosis is. So now that we have the toolbox to diagnose IPF, let's just say that you were able to diagnose someone with IPF. Well, where do you go from here? The patient is ultimately wants to know, what are my options for treatment? So, when I first started doing this, the options were really supportive care. But over the past few years, we have uh, now two therapies that have been FDA approved for IPF that are um, slow the delay and the decline of um, pulmonary function in patients with IPF. Both of these medications have equal efficacy. And so often I am talking to patients in terms of deciding which therapy based on side effect profile. So in terms of treatment of IPF, it would be antifibrotics. Those drugs were tested in patients with mild to moderate disease. Um, those medications, we have increasing data that they may be helpful in preventing exacerbations and um, may have a mortality benefit. So keeping all of those factors in mind when you're counseling patients about whether or not to treat, more and more we are treating patients earlier on in the course of disease. If a patient has secondary pulmonary hypertension, 
There is options for inhaled prostacycline. The data around that is primarily around quality of life and improvement in walk distance. So thinking, talking to patients about whether they wanna undergo a right heart cath and um, tolerate the medication, which is multiple inhalations multiple times a day, but it can lead to improved exercise tolerance and quality of life. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about reflux on the next slides. And ultimately where we really need to be um, going is in more clinical trials because the drugs that we have do not keep patients completely stable or improve their lung function. And so as a field, we are always trying to get to a better therapeutic option. I wanna take a little bit of time on non-pharmacologic therapies. I know that there are upcoming webinars that go into these topics with more uh, in more detail, but I think when you're really talking about care of the IPF patient, it's important, of course, to talk about medication therapy. But I often think of the IPF bundle as including a lot of these non-pharmacologic therapies. So pulmonary rehab um, has been shown to improve quality of life in patients with um, underlying lung disease and is very helpful in improving function as well as offers really important education around this, uh, around what IPF is, how to use oxygen, as well as allows patients to have a community of other patients with Lyme disease. So I refer nearly all of my patients to pulmonary rehab, recognizing that many of them live far from a major city or a major center with pulmonary rehab. There is increasing utilization of um, virtual pulmonary rehab and home exercise programs. So I would encourage you to look at the website, livebetter.com, that was developed by the American Thoracic Society that has not only a way for patients to find the closest pulmonary rehab program, but also a lot, gives them a lot more information about what pulmonary rehab is and where they can access online resources. As part of our initial visit of patients with ILD, we are doing a walk test to see if they need supplemental oxygen. Um, there is mixed data on whether oxygen is that impactful in pulmonary fibrosis, but I have found that treating exertional hypoxemia can allow patients to do more. However, it does require a lot of counseling about lifestyle modifications, appropriate use of oxygen, what the different types of concentrators are, how to work with insurance on oxygen. So this oxygen in, its, in and of itself can often be a complete clinic visit on its own. And I we have trained our nurse to really take this on. Where you have resources, that could be a very helpful educational intervention, or this may be best done in a separate clinic visit because otherwise patients are prescribed oxygen but don't often use it. Palliative care um, can be very important in patients with IPF. We know that IPF tends to be a progressive disease, although we don't know exactly how long an individual patient will live with IPF. We know that most patients die of respiratory failure. I have found that referring patients early to palliative care can be extremely helpful in helping patients and caregivers prepare for what progression of the disease looks like. When I refer patients to palliative care late, um, we often don't have enough time to really think through appropriate symptom management, advanced care planning, and transition to hospice is challenging. We actually did a study here on co-localization of palliative care and ILD clinics and found really high both patient and provider satisfaction, as well as significant improvement in advanced care planning, as well as the utilization of opiates for symptomatic dyspnea. So we can't, if you have access to palliative care for non cancer diagnoses, I would recommend early referral. And a lot of this is framing to your patients. So if you frame palliative care as somebody that works with you, that is part of the team that you refer everyone to, that can deal with symptom management, a lot of patients' anxiety about palliative care being associated with death is alleviated and they seem to have a lot of benefit. And then finally, lung transplantation. I refer all of my patients who do not have a contraindication to lung transplant to the transplant clinic early. And when I say a clear contraindication, I mean they have cancer, they have 
um, severe heart disease that's not been treated, their BMI is over 35, they have advanced age. Um, if they are in a category where it's not totally clear if they will be a candidate or not, my practice is to refer and allow the transplant center the ability to make the decision on their candidacy. I like to give all of my patients the opportunity to learn about transplant and to think through their candidacy with the transplant center. Again, recognizing that referral to transplant can be challenging if patients live far away. Utilization of telehealth for the initial screening can be very helpful. I have found that referring patients early to transplant can be very beneficial because thinking about a lung transplant as well as mobilizing caregivers and finances can be really overwhelming. And if I wait to refer patients to when they really need it, processing not only that their disease has progressed, but also that they need to mobilize all these other resources can be overwhelming. Additionally, I refer people early because this is an IPF tends to occur in an age group that's high risk for um, underlying coronary artery disease. Um, that way, finding out early and intervening may allow them candidacy um, later on when they really need it. So the way I frame this with patients is that transplant is like our back pocket card. We don't want to play it unless we have to, but we want to have the card there. And the best way to have the card in our back pocket is for a patient to establish uh, care with a transplant center. Even being seen once, if the patient has challenges in the future, can facilitate referral, transfer if they're hospitalized, and allow them the opportunity to get transplant. It's important to know your local transplant center's guidelines on what is a true contraindication, what might be a relative contraindication so that you can appropriately counsel patients. Now that we've talked about treatment options, just thinking about what is the prognosis of a patient with IPF. This was a paper that looked at prognosis in patients with IPF who were not treated with antifibrotics. They showed that there was a mean survival of four years and a 69% mortality rate at uh, over five years. So as I said before, this does tend to be a progressive disease um, and often leads to death due to respiratory failure. However, this um, is a range, meaning that there's 30% of patients who live longer than five years. Is there, are there any better ways to really prognosticate for patients uh, what their life expectancy might be like? So there is this gap risk assessment system, which can be found online, the gender age physiology model. And it takes into account factors about the patient, including the gender, their age, and their pulmonary function, and gives you a approximated trajectory of their lung function. Um, again, this is not highly specific, but it can give you an idea. Is the prognosis one to two years? Is it three to five years? And that can be helpful, not only in just general prognosis, but in thinking about decisions around elective surgeries or other issues that patients may face. There is a lot of work going on to try to understand how we can better bring precision medicine to IPF, right? Because you can imagine that hearing an average survival of three to five years is not reassuring to patients and also leads us to be wrong most of the time, right? I tell all my patients, we're not good at predicting the future in medicine. But there is ongoing research looking at various biomarkers, um, including markers of epithelial dysfunction, immune cell regulation, monocyte counts, MCV, uh, genetic factors such as telomere length, telomerase mutations that hopefully in the next few years will allow us to really with more specificity counsel patients on their prognosis. So I really believe that this is an area where the field is going to change in our lifetimes and allow us to sit down with patients and say, I've taken into account your demographics, I've looked at your telomere lengths, I've looked at these biomarkers, and I think that your prognosis will be this, and therefore we are going to refer you to transplant early, or we feel optimistic about your overall survival uh, with antifibrotics. We are not quite at that place yet, so I'm not using biomarkers and genetic markers in clinical practice right now, but as I said, I think there will be, this is an evolving field of research. <laughs>
I want to spend a few minutes talking about acute exacerbations. We talked a little bit about this earlier as a new, um, sort of a unique complication of IPF. Certainly other um, lung disease can exacerbate, but IPF acute exacerbations occur in about five to 10% of people. And it's thought to be a sudden acceleration of fibrosis or the development of acute lung injuries superimposed on the background of reticulation and traction bronchiectasis. The CT scan often shows ground glass opacities superimposed on fibrosis. It has a very high mortality. Mortality rates range based on the study, but can be anywhere between 50 and 85%. Unfortunately, at this time, we don't have any effective therapies. The data around steroids is conflicting. There was a recent retrospective review of steroids um, in IPF that actually showed there was an association with worse outcomes with the treatment of steroids. So this is an area where there isn't clear evidence, but there is some more data that may show that steroids may actually be harmful. Otherwise, we don't have data on whether or not the utilization of antifibrotics in the midst of an acute exacerbation is helpful. There are currently clinical trials looking at other therapies, including plasmapheresis, rituximab, um, other sort of um, biologic agents that may be helpful. But at this point, our only known therapy for acute exacerbation is lung transplant. So if you see a patient that is hospitalized with an acute exacerbation, it would call a transplant center on day one of the admission because it's much easier to transfer patients before they're intubated or before they become really weak over the course of their acute exacerbation. We don't know what exactly causes an acute exacerbation, but we know that patients with more advanced fibrotic lung disease are at increased risk of developing acute exacerbation. We also know that mechanical ventilation um, procedures or operations are also risk factors for acute exacerbations. So I always counsel my patients, even with mild disease, when they're thinking about uh, procedures or surgeries, even in terms of a lung biopsy, just thinking about what the risk uh, benefit calculation will be for each um, surgery, because we certainly don't want to set patients up for acute exacerbations. Gastroesophageal reflux disease and IPF have a long relationship. However, the exact role of reflux and IPF is unclear. There was a recent study that looked at pooled data from three randomized controlled style trials that showed that people who were on antacid therapy had a slower decline in FBC over time. It's not clear if that's causative, meaning it's not clear that treating reflux caused a slower decline in FBC, but there was an association there. There was also a study that looked at Nissen fundoplication for patients who had an abnormal Demeester score done on a 24-hour pH study that showed that the fundoplication was safe, but did not definitively show an improvement in lung function. Additionally, there was a recent study looking at an administrative database that showed that patients with IPF who were on a PPI really had no difference in mortality or hospitalization rate compared to those who were not on a PPI. They also showed that prescribing antacids after an IPF diagnosis was associated with increased mortality. Again, these are all associations. They're not cause and effect, but you can see that the data is conflicting about one, whether or not what the exact role of reflux and IPF is and how aggressively we should be treating reflux um, in IPF. Ultimately, we need a randomized, a prospective randomized control trial to better understand the role of antacid therapy in IPF. For, in my practice, for patients who would otherwise be treated for reflux, they have clear reflux, symptomatic reflux, I think it is reasonable to continue therapy. However, it's not totally clear if patients who don't have symptomatic reflux should undergo antacid therapy or Nissen fundoplication. And I think there will be more follow-up studies in this area to come to help us better guide um, prescribing practices for reflux. Finally, as I mentioned before, I want to just comment on the importance of clinical trials in this disease. So we sort of talked about how we can pharmacologically treat patients, how we can non-pharmacologically treat patients. And what we've arrived at is that we still don't have a cure for IPF. And so 
this is an area of lots of research and the way that we can continue to move the field forward is to enroll patients in clinical trials so that we can find new medications and new therapies that will ultimately lead to a cure for this disease. Um, I can't emphasize enough how important it is as your pulmonologist that patients trust to talk about clinical trials and refer them to a center. Patients can find and pulmonologists can find enrolling clinical trials near them on the pulmonaryfibrosis.org website. Um, just type in the zip code and it will pop up. There are ongoing open clinical trials right now um, that are enrolling. If you're interested, check out this website and you can learn more about the trials. Um, but I really think this is so important in moving the field forward. With that, I will conclude with IPF is a progressive fibrotic lung disease. Untreated, the mean survival is around four years. There are treatment options to slow progression, but not a cure yet. So further research studies are critically important. Thank you so much for taking the time with me today. And I will now uh, take any questions from the audience.